Hello, everyone. This is Sanaya, and I'm back with you on the Project Loving Myself podcast. My guest today is Sandra Limonon, a.k.a. Mama Limonada. She is a Miss Universe Philippines 2020 candidate representing Tagig. Now, it's not hard to figure out Sandra because of how vocal she is about her point of view. She is a self-love advocate, strongly defying what she calls are the unhealthy beauty standards set by society. She urges women to love and accept themselves as they are, no matter what anyone says, proclaiming that true beauty comes from the heart. She values kindness as the first step to respecting and understanding each other, that diversity and inclusivity is a way that we can all be a better version of ourselves. Now, I brought her on the podcast today to talk about her journey to well-being, especially considering how Sandra's struggles and traumas in her past are representative of the kinds of challenges many women face in our world today. I hope today's episode will be as much a healing conversation for her as it will be for others. So let's go ahead and welcome Sandra Lemonon, fourth runner-up of Miss World Philippines 2016, an avid LGBTQ plus supporter, and an adrenaline junkie by nature. Welcome to the show, Sandra. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Um, actually, when you reached out to me, this was an amazing opportunity because I looked at your profile. I really value what you do, and I'm so happy to be part of this. So thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Sandra. Actually, when I uh, first encountered sort of your advocacy and how you feel about some of the topics that I've already introduced in uh, in the beginning of the the podcast, I just felt that you know you really have something important to say, and I think you are definitely somebody who is a role model for a lot of women, you know, in the millennial and the younger generation. I think that you know you're kind of like a, a beacon of light. Um, <laughs> as Considering you are in the beauty industry and you find a way, I think that's what is really um, what I appreciate is you find a way to balance being in the industry of, you know, beauty and fashion and sort of that outward um, image with the self-love advocacy, with sort of what's going on within you. And I know you've had your own struggles in having to get that, which is what I would love to explore in our episode today. I'm so excited. Thank you. Thank you. But that is true. It is a very difficult balance to maintain. And sometimes I do go off balance. <laughs> I think we need to find back our center. So I'm just really excited to share that today. And thank you so much for touching on the topics that I don't usually get to um, discuss. It is very important. So I'm so happy to have that opportunity. Um, thank you also, Sandra, for sharing that you do get off balance. And, you know, we all do. <laughs> Right? I mean, I, yes. Life is, a, life is a process of finding our balance. You know, every time we fall out of it, we need to have those rituals or, you know, some kind of a technique, something that we know what, what to do for ourselves to get us back yes. to center, to get us grounded. Yes. So now, now, Sandra, you are fluent in seven languages and before <laughs> entering... Before entering beauty pageants, you worked as a bartender, waitress, and a baker. So how yes. did you get from all of that into kind of beauty pageants and modeling? Like, how did you make that that jump? Well, um, first of all, I don't speak seven languages fluently, but I do know how to speak a majority of languages pretty, pretty well. So French, Portuguese, English is my fluent languages, written and spoken. And the rest, I could understand Spanish, Cantonese, and Tagalog. So... I wouldn't say fluent, but I'm learning and willing to learn more. <laughs> and <laughs> I really love languages, actually. I love connecting to people, and I really think that language is a strong point where we can understand one another clearly because, of course, we can use body language and we can try to communicate in other ways. But if you know someone's language, I feel like they will have such uh, deeper understanding of you and it's easier for you to communicate, of course. <laughs> and, I think also that people appreciate when you try to speak in their language because it makes them feel like you respect their country. Yes. Yes. You respect who they are, you know, rather than forcing them 
to speak your language. Exactly. So, <laughs> exactly. That's, that's true. So I'm really, really happy about that. Um, how did I went from all of the previous jobs to the beauty industry? That's a very good question. I actually dived in the beauty industry when I was in the year 2016 mm -hmm. and I was going through self-love journey. I was wondering what am I going to do? Cause I really loved the beauty industry. I love getting ready, getting glammed up, but at the same time, I wanted it to be portrayed in the terms that I wished everyone would be understanding about. And that is mm -hmm. not judging anyone or not putting labels on how women or people in general should look like or what they have to be portrayed because of what society puts us accountable for. And I've struggled a lot with that because I've been from being a little bit of a bigger lady to now a thinner lady to now a healthier woman. <laughs> <laughs> so I've transitioned to all of um, different forms and I'm really happy that I took this journey. I actually didn't know where it's going to lead. I was in France when I was um, studying fashion design. That's what I really wanted to do. And then something told me that I wanted to go to the Philippines and my parents were already here. And I said, why not try to go to the Philippines and see what I can discover from that part mm -hmm. of me because I am half Philippine and half French. And it's been a very difficult journey to know where I came from and who I am because I am a mix of cultures. I grew up in Macau and in Macau, we, um, I went to a Chinese school, but at the same time, I also went to a Portuguese school. So I am very happy and blessed that I got a uh, opportunity to be in multiple cultures to immerse myself and at the same time to learn about how people react to towards that and what i got is that not a lot of people are very understanding they want mm -hmm. a very concrete idea of either black and white and sometimes that's not really the case i feel like i say in tagalog we have this um dessert it's called the halo halo and they have Yes. <laughs> and it's pretty much a mix of everything. And that's what I feel like I am. I'm a mix of everything. But at the same time, I feel that I belong in this big, big world that we can find a lot of things in common with one another by anything. And I'm just so happy that I am finally in a place where I feel that I can be my most authentic self and that is not someone that is perfect that's not someone that knows everything it's going to say everything right because i am not i i like that i acknowledge my mistakes i did a lot of um funny mistakes even on <laughs> on camera and live tv to a big big audience but that with that mistake i've learned so much actually it it taught me that in the end, I still stand to my core values. And all of that goes back to growing up with so many cultures and mixed people. And I got to see firsthand what that can do to someone. And I have so many beautiful friends from across the world and I wouldn't change that for anything. So even if I got a lot of shame and a lot of question, maybe questioning about are you more Filipino? Are you more French? Are you from Macau? Are you Macanese? Uh, are you now Chinese because you grew up in China? Um, I really struggled with finding my identity, but right now I feel like I can say I'm a little bit of everything and that's okay. <laughs> You're a global citizen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. You know, Sandra, like I grew up in a multicultural background as well, from a multicultural background. And I think that when you come from a mix of places or you're exposed to different um, countries and nationalities and cultures, I think, first of all, you develop an appreciation for that. Yes. But more importantly, I think that you work a little harder to yes. find who you are. Yes. Right? I like, I mean, if you are raised in one country with one religion, one nationality, and everybody you know is from the same background, yes. then it's a very different experience and maybe there's not that much of a inclination or even an initiative to find out yeah. who you really are is because you relate to everyone in the same way that they relate to you. And 
you're just kind of like everyone else. Yes. Right. So I think that when we are in these kind of situations, we are perhaps maybe cornered in having to figure out who we are, despite yes. <laughs> all these influences. And I think that's the beauty, you know, it is, um, it is the beauty. Now, I think what you were referring to and what you were saying earlier about, you know, saying things on screen and so on is what happened in the Miss World Philippines 2016. Um, um, Bini Bini, sorry. Bini Bini. <laughs> Bini Bini. Okay. Yes. So tell, tell me about that. That was 2018. Uh, yes. Tell me about that experience. Well, first off, um, that would be my second time joining a national pageant. The first time was Miss World. I had no knowledge whatsoever. I really went there to put myself in a very uncomfortable situation because I have stage fright. I am very scared of being on stage and I wanted to overcome that fear. So I have this um, funny tactic that I think it might work sometimes for me at least is to be there and see what happens <laughs> and usually that's uh you know it could cause some very funny situations so in 2018 um i learned a little bit more about pageantry i learned how to compose myself and how i could overcome that fear and so i was a little bit too confident with my knowledge because <laughs> in the when they called us for q a I was the first one to be called out. I'm really excited because I really did study and prepared for all of the questions that I thought a pageant would require. And I even had some questions that were very controversial, um, maybe about how do I feel about abortion or same-sex marriage or the LGBTQ community. But the question that I had was very... Um, unique and it's the first time that it's been asked in any beauty pageant and I am very proud that I got to also answer in a very unique way <laughs> because it's the first time ever that anyone any beauty queen um, actually admitted on stage saying that she has no knowledge about what the topic they asked and in that moment when I was there. I was very ashamed of myself because I had a big group of people that were supporting me. It was the first time that my family went to watch me and I really love my family and I want to make them proud. I feel like everybody has that um, urge. They want to make their families happy. And when I saw that I couldn't deliver and in that split second, I said, okay, I had two choices. Either I invent whatever I heard and go from there and say whatever I think the subject is, which is not very aligned with me. Or I be honest and say what I had to say and deal with the consequences, but at least I stuck to who I am. And that's what I really want is to always, you know, be real. I, if I don't know, I will say I don't know and I will deal with it later. <laughs> but for sure, on the on the night itself, um, I cried myself to sleep. I went home alone and I was really, really, really sad. Thank goodness I had my boyfriend that was supporting me at that time. And he told me, you know what? I don't think that they will take it against you. I really respect what you did. And that was a really tough situation to be in. And at the same time, um, it started a conversation. So the whole Philippines, um, because of what happened, it became a lesson for people to also get more knowledge about what is the build, build, build program, which I think was not really discussed in the Philippines. So my mistake was a bigger gift. And at that moment, I couldn't see it. But after time passed, I really was thankful for what happened. And the next day, I saw that it went viral, which I put my phone away because I was like, oh, God, I am a meme. And now everyone's going to make fun of me. And the stage fright is now um, in social media. It's another <laughs> level. <laughs> so you can imagine how terrified I was. And I really took a good week before facing any anyone or even talking about that subject. I really was really ashamed of myself because um, I thought I was able to perform. And when you're in a beauty pageant, you should perform no matter whatever consequences. But I'm happy that I stuck to my gut. <laughs> you know, uh, Sandra, even though you didn't have an answer, 
I think what you were really recognized for is that you were able to answer the question saying that I, I don't know <laughs> with confidence, right? <laughs> and I think- That's true. <laughs> I, think, I think people really appreciated the honesty because from my point of view, there are two things that take a lot of courage. One is to admit you're wrong. Yes. And the other one is to admit that you don't know. Yes, I agree. Okay? <laughs> and, and sometimes when people do not want to admit they're wrong or they do not want to admit that they don't have an answer, they'll make up an answer or yes. they'll sort of polarize and be more stuck to the wrong answer. Okay. Yes. And then that's when you get a lot of misinformation. Yes. So sometimes it's better just to admit the truth yeah. and, you know, be honest that I, I don't know the answer to this, but, you know, I can go look it up or I can <laughs> learn more the next time, you know? And yes. I, I understand that it might have been just a very, you know, traumatic experience, but I'm sure you can see how much it also uh, benefited you, as you said, in the, in the long run. It did. It really did. So I'm really thankful because when I look back, um, I've had a lot of moments like that. I, I see it as a repetition of cycles. Okay. I always have a downfall. And every downfall that I've ever experienced, I realize that I come back up, but stronger. And I feel like I needed to have these, let's say, pitfalls to understand my worth and my value because I don't think I was understanding that before. I had no knowledge of how much power I actually have. And it's such a beautiful lesson to see after so many years and looking back and I'm like, wow, I've grown so much. <laughs> so I'm really, really happy. I'm really thankful for all of everything that ever happened, even if it might not been... Um, that good. You know, I always say, I always say, Sandra, that um, everything in our life matters. It you does. know, all our experiences, good or bad, they brought us to where we are today. Yes. And somehow, if we hadn't taken those wrong turns or we hadn't gone through pitfalls, we hadn't fallen and had to get up again, we would have never learned, you know, whatever lessons or whatever um, traits that we may have acquired from those yes. situations, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I, I think it's it's great that you can see and acknowledge that um, you've grown so much from these experiences. That's what makes you who you are today. Yes. And I'm really happy about that. But this is something new. I didn't um, I didn't know of that or did I looked back into those moments. It's something that I just realized actually this year. So okay. um it's very still new to me to look back and see the growth because before I wouldn't acknowledge that I would have more negative thoughts and okay. always saying to myself that, oh, I can do better, I can do better. So now I'm trying to respect myself and acknowledge that that's part of me, part of who I am, and I have nothing to be ashamed of it. So very, very happy. <laughs> now you, you've taken a, a stand Sandra, on a couple of different things. And oh, one yes, of them, I did. <laughs> right. And you've been, you know, you've been quite uh, busy on social media. Um, <laughs> I, I believe that you took a strong stand about the chismis culture here yeah. in the Philippines. And I believe you said that this culture should be canceled because uh, humans are not perfect. We're not perfect. And I believe you were defending Miss Universe 2018, Catriona Gray, in yeah. a particular incident that happened. And yeah. First of all, I admire that, again, you, you know, you use your courage, you stepped up and you made a stand um, and you, you know, very clear about what you believe. Um, you. But how do you feel about gossip? How do you feel about this kind of um, feedback that we get on social media? You know, when we, when we post pictures, when we, you know, are talking about our lives. I mean, do we, are we setting ourselves up for people to comment just by being in that public space? And does that entitle them now to have an opinion? And sort of what is your way around? Because you are a public figure, and I'm sure you're going to be an even bigger public figure. So this <laughs> is definitely something you got to figure out. So what is your stand on it today? Well, from what had happened, I 
don't agree at all with chismis because first off, people need to know facts. We need to have, I at least like to know the real, what happened, if you were there, um, you have a better understanding of the situation. And of course, things can be portrayed in a certain way, especially in social media or in TV, whatever mm -hmm. form. Things can come out of context. And it's right. very, very easy to misunderstand or be fast to judge someone by how it looks like. Because when you collect the evidence or pieces together, let's say, it doesn't quite add up. So people like to... Um, do a headline instead of actually understanding what's really the cause, the root of the problem. And that's something that I really, I will actually say the word for it. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I really hate it because I know what it feels like to be in a position where your, your words are taken out of context and you have no control whatsoever of that outcome. And it's not fair. Because in the end of the day, I feel like any person should have the right to express their experience. And if the viewers or whoever is reading that information ha doesn't agree with or whatever opinion they might have, we are still human beings and we are not made to know or accept every bit information from all of the humans that are in this planet on social media. Mm -hmm. We are not made to know or acknowledge all of that input, whether it be um, constructive criticism or not. And it is very unhealthy for someone to be so in tune with all of the comments and with everything that they say in social media, even if it, it is true. It's You need to find the balance. And for me, what I've learned is I will put out my opinion and I don't want anyone to be offended by it. So usually I will put a disclaimer saying that this is not to offend or trigger anyone, right. but this is just my opinion, my personal views. And if it does resonate with someone, then I am happy. And if it doesn't resonate with someone else, I am not offended by it. I'm not hurt that you don't have the same views as me. I want people to have their own opinion and to voice out their own concerns or whatever that may be in a healthier way. We can have open communication and that is really important for me. I don't think that chismis is open communication. I think it's a direct narrative to a negative um, headline. And I think that should be stopped because why do we need to continue that? And in our culture in the Philippines, we are one of the most supportive people, but at the same time, it is in our culture to sometimes put each other down or to live up to the standards that they grew up with. And I don't think that is healthy at all. That makes a lot of room for drama or not being willing to understand someone else or put yourself in their shoes or give them at least the benefit of the doubt. So. I really think that it is important to say what you want to say, but at the same time, don't be affected by the people that have feedback towards you. And you should have a very close knit of very good and healthy friends that will really tell you to your face, I don't think that was right, Sandra, or that was a good thing that you did because you can't listen to every voice, every noise that's out there. You will get confused. It's so easy to fall down. But right. you need to keep it all close together. And if you have a support system, a support group that you can go, that you trust, then that's how I would suggest. And that's how I deal with it, at least. But of course, I have my moments where I'm a mess. <laughs> I have moments where I'm furious and I really want to go back and behind my computer screen and go and say some not so healthy things. But then I come back to my center and I tell myself, is this really the person that I want to be? Is this, am I going to fight the people with hate? No, I want to fight them with love and understanding. So I will come back and correct myself before I do something wrong. But of course, I will have moments that I feel that. And I think that is very 
human. I think that's normal. Um, any person in that type of position, of course, will feel a certain way. And defending someone or even stating your own opinion, you're going to have feedback. And it's normal if you're in social media. And if you're in social media, you can have still your own voice, your own say. And if people don't agree with you, then it's okay to disagree. <laughs> I am open to that communi- like that talk. But you know, Sandra, like if you think about it, this whole idea of being on social media or even being someone who's a public figure, at the end of the day, part of what keeps a person current, what keeps a person sort of visible on social media, because there's a lot of noise, right? There's a lot going on and there's (laughs) a lot of people with different opinions and, and saying different things. Now, to keep yourself actually visible, current, you know, sort of in touch with your followers is to kind of make a little bit of noise yourself, right? And (laughs) you want them to engage because the more engaged they are, the more that connection builds. And that's actually how you become more of a presence on social media. Yes. Yes. So it's kind of like a double edged sword. On one hand, we we want to create that kind of engagement and it is part of um, the way of social media of increasing presence. But on the other hand, the more you connect with people, the more you're going to end up inviting other people's opinions and judgments. And it's sort of part of the game. Yes, but I don't like to play this type of game. And so I I'm not. it is not that important for me to be just making noise just to make noise or to have followers or to build a impact. I really want to build an impact by my values and by people knowing who I am truly. So if that is beneficial for me and what I do helps that engagement and connection to people, then I am so happy. But if that doesn't um, happen, I won't take that against anyone nor myself. And I'm not looking for that recognition. I am at the place and point of my uh, life that I feel completely okay, whether I have the followers or not. And I'm so happy that I do. But if one day that will disappear, I know that I will still be okay. (laughs) So, So what you're talking about is being so secure and confident with who you are that it doesn't really matter. And I think where people fall into that trap where they end up becoming sort of like a slave to the engagement in the comments and sort of what other people are saying is when they don't feel so secure and confident and they're almost depending on that to kind of confirm their own worth or to validate them. Yes. And uh, I've been there. I've been there and I can still go there. I'm not uh, 100% okay with everything and all of the feedback I get. Of course, I'm, I'm still vulnerable, but I know how to put myself in a position where I'm safe and secured and I have to because you need to separate it. As much as you can dive in very deeply inside and disappear for a while, you need to know how to come out of it and you need to know really who you are, what you stand for. Is this really necessary? Is this important to you? And Mm -hmm. that's what I always come back to. Okay. Now, Sandra, would you say that your experiences in childhood shaped you quite a bit in sort of achieving the kind of attitude you have today? For sure. (laughs) Okay. 100%. So if if you're okay with that, I want to talk a little bit about something that you have also mentioned before, um, that, you know, you suffered through quite a bit of abuse between the ages of 13 and 16. And as a result, you experienced depression, you had suicidal thoughts, and um, that the abuse was coming from someone close to you. And it was both physical and mental, and it was someone you trusted. Okay. So first of all, I want to also... um, really thank you for sharing that story on social media, because I think a lot of people are very afraid of how it makes them sound when they yeah. admit to being abused. Okay. And that is something very, very difficult. And I know there's a Me Too movement, you know, globally, and people are, are starting to have the conversation. But I know in the Philippines, it's a lot more common than most people think. Yes. And, and most people will not talk about it. And the only reason I know how common this is, is because, you know, I I work with people through healing sessions and coaching sessions. And this is something that comes up 
so often yes. that I'm amazed that there is no real open conversation about it. So tell me about that experience, how it shaped you and, um, you know, where you are with that today. I'm still healing. I am not 100% and I don't ever think that I'll be 100% okay with what had happened because it is a trauma and I will have triggers and I have to work on that. But I can say that I am in a place where I feel at least secure and content with my growth. And okay. It has really shaped the person that I am today. A lot of the insecurities that I had and all of the um, doubt, self-doubt and negative comments and not ever thinking I was worthy or enough, I really felt dirty. I felt like I am not made to be anything better than what had happened to me. I should always hide and be ashamed of what had happened but mm -hmm. I'm so happy it's it's a very weird thing to explain because I am happy that that happened to me for me to experience and know what it is like to be in that situation so I can have compassion for other people and understanding but of course I am upset at the same time that I had to go through that situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when I was younger, I think I was definitely more vulnerable to all of the things that had happened. I had moments that I, back then I had no knowledge that I was suicidal. I, I didn't know what, at all. I just, when I think about it now, I can say I was suicidal because I had this um, thing that I would do. I would actually, I, would, I lived in the 13th floor in Macau and that is pretty tall. It's a pretty tall building. And I would sit on the ledge of my window and sometimes I wouldn't recall um, remembering what had happened. And at that time, I don't think that I was um, aware about what I was doing and how dangerous that could be. But now when I look back at it, I understand my pain and what I think I was feeling at that time, <laughs> even yeah. though I have very um, foggy memories about that time because I think my brain don't, doesn't want to remember and yeah. it couldn't handle all of the abuse. But when I put myself in that moment and that little girl, I can see that I had still such amazing people around me. And I think that's what kept me going. I had um, amazing opportunities coming. And that's the only thing I would think about. I would always say, don't worry, it's going to pass. Just hang on one more day and the right. next day it's going to get better. And then I would repeat that and repeat that every single day until it did get better. And I'm so happy that I didn't fall into that trap where I could not be here today. And I'm really mm -hmm. happy that I had amazing friends that were very supportive. Even though they didn't know my situation at that time, they could see the bruises or they could see that sometimes I wouldn't be um, normal Sandra, which is happily and bubbly. I would maybe be very pensive and thinking about what had happened. And then you could see me switch back to being a smiley version Sandra. So, it's a very difficult process and I'm still learning how to cope with it. That's the okay. word. <laughs> I need to cope. Now, Sandra, for a lot of people in your position, one of the things that really I uh, wanted to focus on is this an inability at that point to really talk to anybody else or to call out the abuse. I think yes. that's something that I really see um, as a theme for most people is yes. Number one, the inability to actually get help. Okay? Yes. And a lot of people blame themselves for that. You know, when they're yeah. older and they look back and then they blame themselves. Like, why didn't I get help? Or why didn't I tell somebody? The other thing that comes is the shame as if it's your fault that it happened to you. 
Yes. Right. And then the third thing that I also see happen quite a bit is, and, and you mentioned that, is the feeling like there's something wrong with you, like you're dirty or you're yes. bad or, you know, you're the one who instigated Cut. or provoked it or you deserve it. Yes. Right. And I'm sure um, from the little you've told me that these are kind of things that you went through. Oh, for sure. I definitely... Um, well, the abuse mentally that I got were words saying that you deserve this, you, you're not supposed to be here, I, you're so stupid, I don't know why you're even alive at this point, you should die. And of course, hearing these words constantly for years and that being repeated and someone that you respected and highly was near in your life, that really will break you. And it will cause some some type of doubt within yourself. Even, I feel like even if you would be the most confident person at that time, with all of these words repeating, it does make an effect to you. Especially when you're young, for sure. Because that's when you're vulnerable. You're trying to figure out who you are and you don't know anything. And at that time, I didn't have anyone that I could talk to about this because... Um, at the same time, I don't know even how to start that conversation. It's a very um, awkward conversation to talk about. Um, people, my close friends would know of it when they would see me afterwards or see the bruises or see me crying or breaking down. Right. And it was a very difficult position. And even now, only this year, I was very vocal with it because I really wanted to be someone that is not ashamed of that anymore. I want to separate that from me that I know that's not, not my fault. And even though I believe that for so many years that I instigated it and I deserved it and it was a very unhealthy place. But like I said, it's one of the biggest blessings that I've ever had because I can now have compassion. I can now understand how hard it is to say it out loud. And I think the first time I said it out loud, I actually cried, but I felt like a, a wave of happiness and freedom. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, wow, this doesn't have to um, be a burden for me anymore. This doesn't yeah. have to be a secret anymore. I can actually just say it and then move on. <laughs> And now I'm so happy I did that. But of course, it was a very difficult, very difficult journey because I had to, at least the way that I chose to deal with it is I had to remember some parts. I had to mm -hmm. try to understand the abuser and why they would do that to me because that was one of my biggest questions of why would someone that loves me would do something so horrible to me? And right. then I realized and got more um, information and I realized that they too were abused and they too were in this environment where they thought this was normal. So they passed it on to me, unfortunately. Right. And I'm so happy to break that cycle and I don't want to pass it on to anyone in my life. <laughs> I just want to pass on the knowledge of what it is like to be in that position but I would never want anyone to feel that because it's a very dangerous place to be. It's very easy to just give up. And it's so much more difficult to come out of it and be stronger, but I'm glad that I'm here. <laughs> You know, um, Sandra, you're spot on. First of all, abuse does tend to travel down generations. Um, normally, the person who's abusing the other person is very likely to have an abuse themselves, themselves, themselves when they were a child. And most of the time, the person who's doing the abuse doesn't quite understand or process that what they're doing is wrong because yeah. that's the only way they know how. Exactly. And it's only when we start to heal that we start to acknowledge what we've been through to be able yes. to stop it and make sure we do not pass it down you yes. know, because it, it becomes like ingrained. And before you know it, and you're a parent and then you start inflicting things on your children and then you yes. pass it down and you don't want to do that. Right. No. And <laughs> another thing, another area where I see, you know, a lot of abuse is when families try to discipline children. 
Oh, yes. Yes. So we see that happen as well is like in the disciplining, often children can see that as traumatic and painful. Yes. And parents are thinking that they're trying to do something good for children. So yes. I deal with a lot of that as well. You know, I have a lot of clients who are going through that kind of um, situation. And I think that it's very important to stop thinking that it's your fault. And that's yeah. why, you know, I'm really kind of going into this topic, Sandra, because I think there's so many people out there, there are probably so many people listening to this right now who've been through it. Yes, and I want to tell them it's not your fault. Yes. It doesn't mean you did something wrong, but it is time to stop being the victim. And yes. I think when you, yes. when you can talk about it, when you can kind of remember it, you know, heal it, come to terms with it. Like you said, when the first time you talked about it, you stopped being a victim of it. Yes. Right, You took your power back exactly. and you made it your story. Because, you know, while we kind of like, we don't want to remember it, we want to hide from it. We almost kind of, you know, we, we have that foggy mind. We don't want to go back to it because it's really painful. Yes, and it is. <laughs> we, we are trying to protect ourselves, right? Yes. We're trying to preserve ourselves. And we don't want to replay those same, you know, memories or stories over and over again in our mind. Yes. But when we are able to kind of actually face it and confront it, yes. we accept that it happened. And we also can now begin the process of healing. Exactly. And we can take our control back. So, and I've never done this, by the way, on, a, <laughs> on the podcast, but um, I've already gotten permission from you before we yes. started. I want to take you, Sandra, through a healing. We exactly. call it... We call it an inner child healing. What I want you to do is um, to trust me. I'm going to take you back to that childhood and we're going to do a little bit of healing because I know you said that it's still there. You're still coping. You haven't quite completely let it go. And I do, I do know that through healing, through um, the kind of work that I do with people, they can put it behind them. I'm excited. <laughs> Next okay. time to this adventure. <laughs> All right. So here's what we're going to do. I want you to close your eyes for me. Okay. Just relax. I want you to take a deep breath in, in through your nose, and a breathe out through your mouth. Okay. I want you to do two more breaths like that. In through the nose, out through the mouth. And we're just doing this to relax you so you get more comfortable. Okay. Now, Sandra, while you're breathing, do I have the permission to download safety and security into you so you know you're in a very safe place with me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, Sandra, with your eyes closed, I want you to visualize, to imagine that you are looking at that little girl that you once were, okay? That little child who was being abused, who was being hurt, okay? She didn't know how to deal with anything. She didn't understand why it was happening, okay? And she was all alone, fending for herself. Now, in your mind, Sandra, I want you to talk to her. I want you to tell that little girl, I apologize. I was not there for you at that time. I was too young. I couldn't take care of you. And I apologize for what you went through. But I'm here now. I'm older and wiser. I'm stronger. I have courage now. I'm an adult and I can take care of you. I will take care of you. I will protect you. I will always be there and I will never let that happen to you again. And I want you to, you know, bring that little girl into a tight hug. And I want you to just shower her with so much love. And I want you to keep telling her in your mind, I love you. You are safe with me. And as you're doing this, I want you to feel her 
integrating back into your heart. She's almost kind of becoming a part of you. Her energy and yours are one again. And I want you to imagine she is now completely integrated into you. That is, she has grown up to be your age today, to be part of you, of who you are today. And I want you to take a deep breath in. I relax. I'm just going to give you a few seconds to be in that moment. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes for me. Yay. <laughs> I think that worked beautifully. <laughs> how do you feel? Lighter. How, how did she react? Like, how did that little girl react when you were talking to her and telling her those things? I think she was very happy. Okay. And how did you feel when she was integrating back in you? Uh, I felt like I'm whole. <laughs> yeah. That's what this is meant to do. Is because what happened, Sandra, is that little girl, okay, that you were, she got stuck there in the trauma. That's why you were still kind of coping with it. You hadn't quite completely let it go because a part of you is still stuck there, almost replaying the story, the memory over and over again, but deep yes. in your subconscious. Okay. And as much as you tried, yeah. it wasn't over. It was still kind of an open wound. And so what we did, this is called an inner child healing. Okay. We sort of made peace with that memory. And we promised that little girl, that part of you, that you're always going to be there. Okay. And we brought her back into you so that you're complete. You're whole again. <sighs> <laughs> and now, oh my God, now you are ready to conquer the world. I am. I'm ready for the universe. <laughs> <laughs> you did great. You did really great. Thank you. You did amazing. I think, you know, actually, I was really excited for this interview because I love how everything came very organically. And I had a feeling that we would be in this position where I am right now. And I'm so happy that um, I'm open to that. And I'm happy that you are here helping me. I really feel like every person that um, I've encountered along this, my life, really had a purpose. And yeah. I'm so happy for that. And so thank, thank you for, <laughs> thank you for the courage to do this on a podcast. Of course. Well. Of course. <laughs> now, now, Sandra, I still have a few questions for you, okay? Yes. So I'll As a self, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. As a self love advocate, what are your thoughts on the healthy and or the unhealthy and unrealistic beauty standards? that are set by society. I mean, you've been through, as you said, you know, you've gained weight, you've lost weight, yes. and now you you are at what you call is your healthy weight. So yes. what is the message that you want to share to women out there, you know, being in the position that you're in right now? Mm, the message that I would like to share is to not put yourself into any box. Be open and... Don't listen to what society has taught us, what our parents taught us, what our friends believe, or even in general, anyone. Because you don't have to be molded. You can be as free as you want. And if you're happy with yourself, that's the most important. Because, of course, we need to take care of our health and we need to maintain our body because this is what keeping us here. But at the same time, it is more important what's in here and what's in here. And for that, we need to stay healthy. But that doesn't mean that what it might seem that is healthy. For example, I thought that being thinner would make me healthier or would make me think that people would like me more or they would be happy with me or 
anything. I, I was trying to be confined into this box. And then now where I am is I don't look at my weight anymore. Mm -hmm. I try my best to just know that I'm healthy and doing the right decisions with whatever food intake I take or even what I watch or what I read because all of that has an effect on the body. And I really want to emphasize that you need to know what makes you happy. You need to know what is right for you. And as much as anyone else can help you, you need to be willing to do that discovery for yourself. You can have the most and the best support system, but if you're not ready to open yourself and to be there, you can't achieve that. So you need to make a pact and be your own friend. You need to be your own best friend and you need to go through, I think, the ups and downs. And that's what at least I've learned for my own experience. And I don't want anyone to be ashamed of being too thin, too big, not um, what everyone says curvy delicious or need to have all of these unnecessary and unrealistic <laughs> no belly fat um, perfect face perfect teeth white um, especially here we have so many beauty standards that I really dislike and I don't agree with because it's not healthy if we are a race that has more melatonin. <laughs> Why do we want to become something that we are not? Why are we changing our features? And if it is something that really bothers you and that is something from you and it's coming that you want to change, that there is also no shame with doing that. So I am for both. I am not against anyone that wants to change anything with their own body. If you want to do that for your own sake, that makes you happy. I am fully supportive of you, but in healthy standards. Don't take diet pills. Don't do surgery that is not um, necessary to risk your own life. These are all things that are very dangerous, and a lot of people don't talk about it, but it's more common to listen, oh, just do a nose job and tummy tuck and put your teeth and We should be more supportive and explain to people the whole story, the whole process. Um, I feel like everyone has glimpses of how easy it could be to achieve this, how easy it is, just take this. It doesn't work like that. It's a journey. You need to be willing to start and go to the finish line. <laughs> and you need to go through all of that the time frame until you realize what is that you want and not because of what you listened to everyone else's noise of how you should look like or how you should be valued. Even in family, uh, I experienced that my mom would at least say to me, she loves me dearly. She really does. But I think it is in Filipino culture to feed your kids, but at the same time, tell them you're fat, <laughs> stop eating. And mm -hmm. it's very um, contradicting. And sometimes you don't really know where, where to stop. And you can't always wait on for someone. You need to take charge on yourself. So just take a deep breath and you're going to understand that soon. And don't be so hard on yourself. And set, set those standards for yourself. Create them. Yeah. You know, you know, S Sandra, what I think um, for me is a really key message about what you said is the fact that it's about being healthy and yeah. not do things that are detrimental to yourself. Like as someone, you know, I've had two kids. I've uh, obviously I've had to deal with, you know, losing weight from a pregnancy. And that was for me. Like I wanted to fit into my, my clothes that I was wearing pre-pregnancy. And to me, like how I look in my body, how I feel, you know, things like, um, my my teeth are a little bit crooked. I wanted to fix them because it Same. was for me. Yeah, you know, like I don't think there's anything wrong with doing those things that make you feel not that our self-worth or value should come from those things, but yes. if we want to do it because it is something that we want for ourselves, 
then I don't see anything wrong with it. I think where the problem lies is when people start to do it from a place of insecurity. Like if they don't lose the weight, then they are not worthy. Or if they don't lose the weight, then people are going to think they're fat and ugly. You know, so it's kind of when we're doing it for the wrong reasons. I think that's when we get into trouble. And I think when we are doing it also for kind of the unhealthy or the... um, Easy the wrong, way. Yeah, the easy. We start doing things like we cut corners, right? You know, people take diet pills or they don't eat at all. They starve yes. themselves. Or, you know, they do things that potentially could damage their body or yes. damage, you know, the functioning of their body. Because, you know, our hormones depend on the food we eat. We're supposed to have the right balance of like lipids <laughs> and protein and, you know, everything matters in our body. And I think that there are healthy ways to go about self-improvement and self-care and there yes. are unhealthy ways. Yes. So I do agree with you. And I think, you know, what we need to also really make sure people understand is that it's okay to do things to make yourself um, look or feel better, okay, yes. but not at the risk of hurting yourself in any way. Yes. Right? (laughs) Exactly. Now, Sandra, you used to um, hate yourself, you said in an Instagram post, um, and you mentioned a little bit earlier about, you know, feeling dirty or unworthy or a mistake and so on. And I kind of want to revisit that because I think also another important point um, is that when we are kind of raised with statements like that, you know, when we've heard other people say that to us, you're stupid, you're not good enough, wish you weren't alive, any of those kind of sort of negative um, programming that we receive in childhood, as much as we grow up and become different people, it's still there deep down inside. You know, you can sometimes even in certain situations, these kind of like thoughts come out of nowhere, you know, reminding you that you are unworthy, you're not good enough, you're stupid, you're et cetera, et cetera. And It's not something that is very easy to overcome, especially, especially Sandra, because it sits deep down in our subconscious and on our day to day basis, we are in our conscious mind. So we actually don't have the means or the tools to go in and kind of undo all that negative programming. So how did you do it? How did you get to that point that you could start to love yourself and accept yourself and even, you know, trust yourself? given that you were raised with a completely different message? I think the first step I did was to acknowledge that that was not real, which was very difficult. And I've been given a lot of um, moments where I could have that lesson taught to me back. And I said, this is not what I deserve. (laughs) This is, I had enough of this. (laughs) I don't want to be in this environment where I feel that I'm not worthy or that I'm not capable of having a better life for myself. And in those moments, I went back and thought, what did I do that was helping me back then? And when I think about it, I was a big fan of art. I still do it actually today. (laughs) But what I would do is um, I would draw, put music that I like, go to my safe space and kind of be in this environment that was very safe and creative and I could expand and do whatever I wanted. Basically my little world. And then I realized that was actually art therapy that I was doing (laughs) at that time I had no idea but I would be painting drawing if um, you would ask anyone that knows me back then they'd always say oh Sandra is having her own little session (laughs) she's in her own little world you can talk to her later and every time I'd come out of um, drawing or listening to music or anything that would be self-care I would be refreshed and happy and so that is something that I still do until today. It is something that I have to do because I need to go back to that place where I'm okay. I acknowledge that all of that happened, but at the same time, I'm not going to put that burden on me anymore. It is still going to be there sometimes. And like I said, I'm going to have triggers and I'm still 
learning how to cope with it, but it is still a blessing and I wouldn't change anything. And the things that taught me is good group of people that you trust, right. that have good intentions for you and know you in your core. And to find these people, I know it's a very difficult task. You will have to grow through so many different people that um, you will see that some of them are very unhealthy people, unhealthy situations, and you will overcome them if you know that you can do it. You need to believe in yourself. And I feel that even in my subconscious, I know that I can. I, I know I have that feeling in me that whatever will happen, I will still be okay. So that's really something that I don't really have an explanation for. I just can feel it. I know that, right. but I don't really know how to explain that. But the things that I know that can help is therapy, for sure. Voicing out what had happened. And at the same time, doing little routines that will help you. Even just saying that you are worthy or you are beautiful and you can do this. Um, maybe even putting yourself in a situation that you're uncomfortable with. Maybe you have a fear of heights. I'm not saying that you should just jump off a cliff like I did, but at least in my experience, it did help me. <laughs> but there, there, there are other ways to help you and build up. And the great thing about being a human being is that you evolve. You never stay the same. I mean, of course, your core will still be um, somewhat similar, but you get to learn and it grow. And that's the amazing thing. So if you view life in that perspective, I think you will be so much more hopeful and understanding and compassionate to others and yourself. And that's what I try to do every single day. And of course, I'm going to have moments where I go back, but I will catch myself in those moments and say like, okay, now it's a break. You deserve this break and it's okay to take a break. <laughs> and then you can come back because if your glass is not full, I don't know, if your glass is empty, you can't give anymore and you need to fill back your glass. So that's what I'm trying to remind myself every time. So I go yeah. back to that healthy routine. And also, if you do have a pet, it helps so much. <laughs> if they are, they're just, I don't know how to explain it. They just make you happy. They, they don't really, they, you can't even communicate together, but you know, the love that you it's get. It's unconditional love. Yes. You get unconditional <laughs> love from a pet. But, yes. You know, Sandra, you said a lot of very important things right now. I want to highlight those points. So yes. first of all, you mentioned, you know, accepting what happened, sort of, you know, speaking it out is accepting that it happened. It's acknowledging, yeah. yes, this happened to me. I think also making sure you understand that it's what happened to you. It's not who you are, exactly. you know, acknowledging it's an experience or what was said to you or what was done to you. It was something that happened, but it doesn't define you. It doesn't yes. define you. And it is not, um, it is not sort of what you have to be for the rest of your life. No, and then the, the other thing you mentioned was about art therapy. And art therapy is, is essentially a meditative experience. It's the time that you have to connect with yourself. It's yeah. a time of introspection, of self-love. Art therapy is a form of self-love. So I think making sure that you indulge in things that uh, build a sense of connection with yourself, you're sort of yes. going into yourself understanding yourself better, discovering yourself, and spending time with yourself. I think yeah. that was a very key thing for you. And then you mentioned another thing. You said, you know, like if you're afraid of heights to, you know, go jump off a, a cliff. Or <laughs> and, you know, we, we call that comfort zones is when we push those boundaries and we step out of our comfort zone, we actually learn to trust ourselves. We respect ourselves. Yeah. And we can kind of counteract everything that was said about us that's negative by creating new positive notions, experiences, and a relationship with ourselves, We yes. can do that. We have power over ourselves, And I'm so happy to hear that you have taken all these steps and it's gotten to you 
to where you are today. And that is something that is very admirable. So, you you know, amazing. Now, we are going to be ending this um, episode, Sandra. So before we go, um, it was, first of all, such a beautiful session. It was, I think, um, a a great opportunity to... um, to talk to people about yeah. uh, about this these kind of traumatic experiences and and I hope that the healing as well will really go a long way for you. Now, Sandra, what is your project loving myself mantra or message to our listeners? What would you tell them about self love, or what would you do to inspire them to love themselves as you have learned to do? First thing that I would tell someone is to go on a date with yourself. You know, a lot of people don't even know what is their favorite movie, favorite song. And it might be silly to even try to do that, but it is highly necessary. (laughs) That is the first thing to know what you like, what you don't like. Um, Second, I would say respect respect yourself and in order to do that you need to have boundaries you need to have at least a form of what is okay for you and what is not okay for you and then third is to appreciate and learn how to enjoy the small blessings that life will give you it will be always something small a lot of the times, but when it accumulates all together, then you find that it's something so much greater than what you had expected. So you have to be patient. Be patient. It's going to take a long journey, but once you get there, it's so worth it. <laughs> it is really, really worth it. Anything that anyone or whatever situation you're going to be in, you know that you're capable of coming out from it. So I would suggest that try, try to do it. It's going to be hard and it's going to be very challenging. And there are going to be a lot of moments where you will ask yourself, what the I'm doing? (laughs) But once you're there, you couldn't be happier because... I think that's one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself and to others the chance to just be who you are. And that's a very difficult question because that's not what we are taught with. It's, it's, it's actually contradicting to what you're taught. People teach you how to like a certain thing or like a music or behave this way or... Um, don't do things that you shouldn't, even though sometimes you ask why and they just say, because I said so. (laughs) So go discover yourself um, in all ways and shapes and forms and learn to, once you learn to love yourself, you can have the compassion and ability to love others. And that is something that is so beautiful. And I think we should, do that and I feel that a lot of people have been having this opportunity thanks to the pandemic I know that it's a very hard time for all of us but every single person that I have met this year when I met them again even people that are not close to me I feel the change I see something new I feel them resonating in the same frequency and that is something so Um, beautiful but precious and I would want this to continue so I hope that people will remember that no matter how hard it gets it's so worth it I promise (laughs) and that is it I concluded the three things thank you that was uh, that was a really heartfelt and I think a really beautiful message, Sandra. So thank you again for joining us on this episode of the Project Loving Myself podcast. Would you like to share your social, Sandra, if you can let people know how they can follow you? Please go yes. ahead. Um, you could follow me in Sandra Lemonon. 
in either Facebook or Instagram. And I have another page, actually, which is really funny. I have some quotes that I share from people that I follow in social media. I really try my best to have a healthy social media feed. And that is something that you can take control of with the things you want to see so it can uplift you because we all know that social media can be a little bit um, draining sometimes and sometimes you question a lot of things. So you could find me there. I have a nice page called Journey to Self-Healing. And I'm so happy because a lot of the Lemonade supporters, um, they actually send me messages and that means so much to me when I can at least help someone to start their journey that is the biggest gift i could give someone so i'm so happy <laughs> all right thank you thank you okay awesome so we need to do um it was really super thank you so much and i i really enjoyed it and at the same time i feel like this was really meant to happen I know it sounds very strange to hear that because, of course, no. we, we've never met that. We never even met in person, but I really believe in, th in things happening in our lives. So I'm excited. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, I'm a believer. I mean, I'm a believer of all of that. So everything, nothing is a coincidence. And I think we're all really meant to meet and connect with each yes. other like this. But thank you so uh, much. Sandra, it really means a lot. You're, you're very welcome. Hello everyone, this is Sandra Raimundo Lemonon, your Miss Universe to Gig City. Please join me with Sanaya for our project Loving Myself. It's going to be available in Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We'll be sharing how we went through our journeys to self-healing and there are going to be some fun topics and even a healing session. So I hope you stay tuned and watch it. Thank you. So what did you think of that episode? What was your takeaway? Now, this is the first time I ever got to do a healing with one of my guests on the podcast. And honestly, this is the experience of healing that I wish I could share with as many of you who are listening to this podcast. I also want all of those who are listening who may have had similar traumatic experiences to know that you are not alone and that it's safe to actually deal with your past traumas, to confront them and to finally heal and let it go. Share your thoughts with me on at Project Loving Myself on Instagram and Facebook and also at Sanaya Gurnamal, S-A-N-A-I-Y-A-H-G-U-R-N-A-M-A-L on all social media channels. Thank you for joining me on today's episode of the Project Loving Myself podcast, where we are on this Project Loving Myself journey together. Our thought for this week, in order to love who you are, you cannot hate the experiences that shaped you. So accept yourself and accept your story. Thank you for spending time with me today on this episode of Wellbeing and Healing. Keep reminding yourself that you are loved. This is Sanaya on the Project Loving Myself podcast, powered by Podcast Network Asia and Podmetrics. Bye-bye.